Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Bobby and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Bobby. I've been sober since June 10th, 2002, and that is also my parole date. <laughs> <laughs> just surreptitiously they kind of match same day and uh <laughs> i'd like to thank tim for asking me to speak it's really an honor and privilege to do anything for alcoholics anonymous and uh mitch happy birthday and ron and jim i'm glad you guys are here it's it's a good deal to see see newcomers come in i mean calling that hotline you know that's a big step just picking up that phone and calling and say man i really need help but you know, I get those calls. I take the hotline in Oklahoma. I get those calls all the time. People call me up and say, I really think I need help. But, you know, to actually get somebody in a car to go somewhere with you, that's a whole nother challenge, you know. You go, well, I'll come pick you up, man. I'll help you any way I can. And they're like, well, I'm kind of busy tomorrow. <laughs> Most of the time, we got something to do, you know. <laughs> you know, a lot of times we're real sick and real sorry, but, you know. Well, I don't know, man. I was usually sick. Of, you know, I was usually sick because I got caught doing something. <laughs> Real sorry I got caught, you know. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's great to be up here. I love this town, you know. I used to live here. As a matter of fact, the very first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous I ever went to was just right up here on Jupiter and uh, Plano Road. Is that where the LPOG used to be? Plano Original Group? I don't know if anybody knows, but it was an old house over there. And that's the first... Meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous I ever went to in 1985. Somebody was talking, Ronnie was saying 1992. I'm like, yeah, I beat that by seven years. And we have practically the same sobriety day. It is, mine's in June and his is what, in August? Yeah, and so, you know, I was just hard-headed, you know. I mean, I came in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous for a long time before I actually decided to stick with it. <coughs> anyway, uh... My job tonight is to tell you what it was like, what happened, what it's like now. So for, to the best of my ability, I'm going to do that. Um, you know, I, I started drinking in 1965, and that's a long time. And I know you're thinking, oh, man, we only go till 930 here. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm a blackout drinker as far back as I can remember. And as paradoxically as that sounds, that's the truth. So I don't remember a whole lot of stuff. So there's a lot of holes in there. So we don't have to worry about it. You know, I just tell you what I know and then, you know, go from there. I do remember a lot about my sobriety, even though some of that's kind of hazy. <laughs> <laughs> I was born in Oklahoma, and, uh, you know, what a place to be born. And, uh, man, you know, and uh, I, my parents were hardworking people, and they were not alcoholics, you know. They just wasn't, and they were good people. I mean, I thought that they wasn't good enough to be my parents, of course. I thought that I deserved to have rich, you know. I'd see on TV all these people had rich parents, with, and they got to do all these things. And, you know, my parents were not wealthy, and I felt like I deserved more. But I know today that they were good parents, and, you know, they did the best that they could do. And uh, they both worked hard, and and they didn't. They drank you know, like once in a while, but they didn't do it every day. They didn't drink and they fought a little bit, but they stayed together until my dad passed away um, in 84, 20 years ago. And uh, they were always together. So, you know, people wouldn't leave and I don't come from a broken home. You know, I wasn't abused real bad. I mean, I got, you know, physically abused. They didn't call it, you know, uh, child abuse back then. They just called it a butt whipping, you know. <laughs> It wasn't none of this child abuse, you know. You skip school and throw a rock through the neighbor's window and stuff, you know. You had something coming. <laughs> Came on, <laughs> you know. Even that, you know. And if you, you know, it sometimes if your parents wasn't around, the neighbors would whip you, you know. And it was just that way, you know. <laughs> just a different time. You know, we were wild kids for real. My brothers and I. I don't know if I was the wildest or not. I have. I came from a family of four, uh, four brothers, five boys. I have four brothers. And, uh, two of them went away to the Navy when I was very young, when I was about five. And, uh, there was just, um, my other two brothers and I, one year, two years older than me, one, one year younger than me. And, you know, we were pretty wild kids. And it didn't, 
My older brother, I always thought that he was pretty wild, and he's a drinker today. You know, he drink, all my brothers drank, but they all quit. They drank heavy, too, all of them. They drank hard, you know. They drank to the point of getting themselves in trouble. But all but the brother I have, uh, he actually lives in Denton, stopped. And the one I li- that lives in Denton still drinks every day on a daily basis. And I don't know if he's an alcoholic, but he, he certainly smells like one, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, but... You know, I, you know, I can only try to be the best example I can be around family. Family's the hardest people you can, you know, try to reach to. And they, he knows how I was and how I am now. And, <clears throat> you know, it's a hard thing to, you know, he probably doesn't think he has the problem I did because he didn't, the consequences he pays have never been as severe as the ones I paid. I've always paid the worst ones. But anyway, uh, you know, I grew up and uh, I went to school in Oklahoma and City and in Norman. And uh, I started drinking when I was 12, like I said, in 1965. And I probably drank some beers before that and stuff. But the time that I can remember, it, I was 12 years old. And I went to this party and uh, my brother had to drag me with him, which probably caused, he's probably got resen- enough resistance to keep him drinking for a while even now. But he had to take me with him everywhere. And and uh we went to this party. Uh This girl was having a party because her she was about 17 and her boyfriend was getting out of prison. What an ironic story. <laughs> <laughs> and uh they had booze there, you know. And uh they had a, a lot of booze. They had beer and whiskey and vodka. And they said, what do you want to drink? And I'm like, man, you know, I'm like, I don't know. I, I tasted beer. It didn't taste so great. And I heard that whiskey really burns. I looked at the vodka, and it looked really clear and nice. I thought, man, I'll have some of that vodka, you know. They poured me up a little glass of it. Man, I tasted it. I tell you what, it did not taste clear at all. It tasted, (laughs) man, it burned, and doggone it, you know. But the more I kept drinking on it, you know, it started tasting all right. Well, it never tasted all right, but it started feeling all right. I mean, before that night was over, you know, You know, I just went nuts. I mean, I started getting real brave. I mean, I didn't, you know, I didn't, I don't remember thinking that I was better looking or cooler or anything, but I started just, my inhibitions just went right out the window, you know. I just felt free, you know, and pretty soon I'm chasing around that 17-year-old convict girl, you know. (laughs) I don't know what I would have done with her if I caught her. I mean, I was 12 years old. We didn't have sex education back there either, you know. (laughs) I would, but... You know, I knew she had what I wanted. I, for some reason, I knew that I wanted to grab her, but I didn't. <laughs> I really didn't know what I would have done still. But, uh, you know, and, and, you know, that very first night, I, I, you know, drank till I passed out and woke up and got really sick. But I didn't say that I wasn't going to ever do this again. I loved it. And I would, you know, and from that point on, every weekend, we went out and bought beer. We bought quart of beer each that was what we started out with we'd save our we had this little hustle going i always had a hustle my whole life i mean i'm a thief too i'll have to tell you straight up <laughs> <laughs> i stole away before i drank if it wasn't nailed down I'm, it's mine <laughs> even today i have to practice a program rigorous honest if i see a tool laying somewhere or something I'm, whoa i think i lost that you know, I have to remember that just because it's laying somewhere, it doesn't belong to me, you know, <laughs> to this day, I'm, just, I'll tell you the truth, but, uh, but, uh, and we, every weekend we'd go out and we would like pull our uh, movie money together. We'd buy beer with our movie money, you know, then we would all pile in this car and, uh, get in the trunk and go to the drive-ins. One guy would drive through the drive-in deal every weekend. I mean, this is when they had drive-ins, too, for you people that had, it's not really as old as I am, and I'm pretty old. And, uh, you know, I can't believe we got away with it. I mean, how many, my brother was only 14 when he was driving this car. He's, he, he, he didn't look, you know, like, he wasn't, you know, he looked like a 14-year-old kid, but we got away with it. I guess they just didn't care, you know? I mean, they were, like, probably glad to have the business. I don't know, but we did that. I mean, that hustle went on for at least probably two years before... We just got tired of doing it. We never did get caught, you know. We, that's how we drank every weekend. And, uh, you know, that was our deal, drinking every weekend. And, and you know, occasionally I'd drink and go to school, but mostly I kept it on a weekend type of deal until I got into high school. And then, you know, I got into high school in, in 1969, 
you know, and those were some crazy years, and I started trying those other things, you know. I tell you, um, I don't know a whole lot about politics or religion. Those are outside issues, but I did do a lot of drugs, you know. <laughs> and uh, I heard a speaker say not long ago that, that like, drugs was like, your mistress and alcohol was your wife, you know, and I can relate to that because that's kind of the way it was, you know. You'd always fool around with these other things, but you always come home to the one you love, you know. And I did. <laughs> I did. I did fool with that stuff, you know. I started smoking that hippie hay a lot, and you know, I mean, I lived in Norman, Oklahoma, it's a college town, you know, and there was a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff going on, and and. uh you know, that was back in the day, you know, and people were growing their hair long, listening to rock and roll and kind of freaking out. And I even tried LSD, man, you know. Can you imagine me on LSD? <laughs> Come on. I did it like, let's see, one, I think I did it about 2,000 times, you know. <laughs> I really experimented with it. <laughs> You know, until it just started, it started really kind of getting to me after a while. <laughs> I had to come back to earth. But, you know, I tried all those things. and But, you know, I'd always drink. We, I, you know, there was even periods in my life when I thought that I was ahead, you know, that I wasn't an alcoholic. I'm ahead, man. I mean, I'm a drug user and all that stuff. But I always drank the whole time. I didn't, I mean, I drank every, almost every day by this time, you know. I drank all the time on weekends, you know, and... We did all that other stuff, but we drank, and, you know, I played music, and I played in the band, and uh, when I was 15, I got to play in bars, and they would serve me drinks, you know, free drinks, and I could, you know, be, after a while, the guys in my band would quit letting me drink before the gig, because, I mean, I'm an alcoholic. When I start drinking, I can't say, well, I'm going to stop, because I don't want to mess up playing, you know, Jeremiah was a bulldog, <laughs> <laughs> which seems hard to do. <laughs> it can happen, but so you know, at the, at the end of the, at the end of the job, you know, I'd go up and start drinking. Boy, you know, and they'd serve they'd serve me, you know, whatever I wanted, beer, scotch, and soda, whatever I wanted. I didn't know anything about mixing any drinks. I just tell them what I heard on TV. Give me a rum and coke. I didn't know, you know. I was 15. I was still a little kid, but. And, and, you know, when I got a little older, when I was 16 or 17, I started playing at uh, fraternity parties, and I really loved those guys. Those guys, fraternities in Norman were really, you were in a fraternity with you, Mike. <laughs> they really knew how to, they really knew how to party, you know. Those guys would come in and they'd, uh, they'd pour their booze into a big trash can, you know what I'm saying, Purple Passion, you know. I mean, you know, and, and they'd start drinking, and these guys could get crazy. I love those guys. I mean, they'd get crazy. They'd beat us up sometimes. They'd just beat up the band. <laughs> you know? But I still loved them, man. I mean, they drank hard. They were my heroes, man. They drank hard. They would be so drunk, you know? I'd like to know what happened to some of those guys. I mean, I was still in high school, and I was like, you know, these guys, they were going to college, something I knew I'd never do because... You know, that's part of my story, too. You know, I never did graduate from high school. They finally just asked me to leave, you know. <laughs> the vice principal came and said, you, you know, Botel, how long have you been hanging out here? I go, I don't know, three or four or five years. <laughs> because, you know, you've got about four credits. Like, oh, yeah, what's that? <laughs> Is that bad? Or <laughs> 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 so... They finally just tell me, man, you go hang out somewhere else, you know, go away. And I'm going to notify the draft board. That really hurt, you know. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> That's when it started getting serious, you know. This is in 71. They were still drafting people. And they were still sending them to Vietnam, but I didn't get drafted. I didn't really want to go, you know. I didn't join either. I just kind of stayed at home, hung out, took care of the home front. <laughs> You know, and uh, so they kicked me out of high school, and you know, I'm just hanging around playing music. You know, I, you know, you know, at the time, I didn't think about working. Well, I had this eyesight problem, real bad. I couldn't see myself going to work. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, or getting a job. You know, I mean, 
I was a musician, you know, and I, had, I thought, you know, that was my calling and that I had these anointed hands and I didn't want to, you know, hurt them on a job or something, you know. So, you know, it was Norman, Oklahoma and university town and I would find some, you know, girl that was getting her school paid for, you know, and moving to her place because, you know, daddy was paying for the groceries and the rent. And he usually lived in another town. And, you know, I was just, I'm just a slacker like that. I mean, I'm not a good guy. I'm selfish and, you know, and I would, you know, stay with these, these girls and, uh, you know, and I'd see any other girls that I could grab hold on when I was out playing and stuff. And I'm not proud of that either. I mean, that's just terrible. That's the way I've always been. I look back on those things and I think, man, what is the deal? Why am I like that? But that's the way I was. I'm a real selfish person. You know, it's all about me. Whatever makes me happy or pleases me, that's all I cared about. And, uh, you know, I did that for a long time and I started, you know, since I didn't work, I had to have some income. You know, I had to have some money because, you know, sometimes those girls would get tired of me. I mean, you know, it doesn't take long for a smart college girl to figure out that somebody's a loser. <laughs> you know, so you know, I had a li- I had a little uh, you know I had a little pharmaceutical company kind of going on. You know, kind of helping people out, helping people you know reach their bottom or whatever they did. You know, I was cold blooded with that too. I somebody would come over one day, you know, and their brand new Camaro. They just buy. Hey, look, my dad got me this Camaro. Cool, man. That's nice. You got a hundred reds? Yeah, here. Come back the next day, the grill would be smashed and be in the back. Can I get another hundred reds? <laughs> sure. I mean, you know, don't let it kill you this time, you know. I didn't care, though, you know. As long as I got some money in my pocket, I was all right, you know. But eventually, you know, those kind of, you know, you, you know, you might get away with things for a season, but, you know, it doesn't last forever. And finally, you know, the police pulled me over one day and I had 500 reds and pound of reefer on me. And, uh, I'm like, you know, what? <laughs> Where did this come from? <laughs> this guy made me buy it. You know, I'm trying to lie my way out of it. You know, I got a really light sentence. They sentenced me two years the first sentence. Of course, you know, that really didn't work out because I did a lot of things worse later. But, you know, and, and I tell you, after you get pulled over by the police in a small, Norman was, is 100,000 people now, which is small by Dallas standards. But then it was probably about 50 or 60,000. And all the police pretty much know your number when they got your number. And you guys ever notice how the police just keep picking on you? <laughs> Especially if you're breaking the law, you know? <laughs> You know, they don't pick on you if you straighten up and do right and try to become a member of society. You know, they leave you alone. But if you're still doing the same things, you know, they keep pulling you over. And they did. And so I moved to Dallas. I took my first geographical cure in 77. I thought, man, it's getting hot around here. You know, I keep getting pulled over. I didn't want to go get in any worse trouble. I didn't want to go back to jail. I didn't like that at all. So I thought, well, these guys moved down here that I knew. They started a band down here, and I thought, and they called me, and they said, you want to move to Dallas to be a bass player? I'm like, sure, why not? <laughs> I mean, that was the way my life was, you know? I mean, I didn't have any ties to anybody or anything. My parents still live in Norman, but... So I picked up and moved down here, and, uh, you know, we played around here. And But, you know, my alcohol came with me. I mean, when I got here... You know, the first thing we did was buy a bunch of beer to party. You know, we all got together to start this great band that was going to just wow the whole world. <laughs> so we bought a, you know, a bunch of beers, a bunch of beer. And, and uh, you know, I'm from Oklahoma, so, you know, I'm used to that kind of watery beer, you know. And I came down here and I drank a six pack of that really good Texas beer. And I was like, God bless Texas, man. I, I knew I was destined for this place, you know. I mean, it was just really hit me the way beer is supposed to taste, you know. And felt the way beer is supposed to feel, man. I love that stuff, man. And, boy, I drank a lot of it. And, uh, you know, I lived down here and played with those guys. And, you know, that thing didn't work out. So we kind of drifted apart. And I got me a job down here and stuff. And I met a her down here. And, uh, and, uh. You know, I still pretty much drinking a lot, smoking a lot of pot, and doing other drugs. And uh, but you know, she thought she could fix me. So she, when she thought it, and when she started going out with me, you know, 
I got in a lot of trouble down here too. I, I ran into the same police, it seemed like. And, uh, and, uh, but you know, she, she thought she could fix me. And when she figured out she couldn't, she did this best thing, the smartest thing a woman could do. She married me. <laughs> you know, and we have a son today and we had, we had, a, we had a baby and everything. And, and, uh, you know, I actually started working pretty hard and, after I got married, I, I, I really tried, you know, I really tried. I thought, well, this is, this is the answer. I'm going to be a good husband. I'm going to be a good father. And I'm not going to do all those things that I used to do. And I, and, the, and I tried it and I, you know, but I kept drinking, you know, I just thought, well, if I just drink and I don't do any drugs, and I don't smoke any pot, I don't do any cocaine or anything else, I'll be all right. You know, if I don't do any heroin, you know, if I don't try inject anything in my arms or anything, and just drink, I'll be okay. You know, I really thought that was true. I wasted a lot of time in my life thinking that was all that I could get away with doing just that. And, uh, you know, so we got married and, you know, I, I started painting houses, what I do today. And, uh, I got real busy. It was the early eighties and I, and I started making quite a bit of money more than I'd ever made in my whole life. And I can remember when I started getting some pretty good checks coming in. Cause I had a couple of crews going after a while, you know, and had a lot of stuff going on. And I started, I thought, you know, for the first time in my life, I can, you know, without dealing them, I can buy all the drugs and alcohol that I want, you know, and, and I just started doing that deal. And it, it wasn't, it wasn't very long at all before, you know, I started having some really major problems. So, <clears throat> um, I went to a psychiatrist. I mean, come on. <laughs> That's what I did, though. I mean, I, I'd heard of other things like AA and stuff, but I, I thought that was for, you know, shallow, not com not complicated people like me. You know, I mean, I have a lot of issues. I mean, Alcoholics Anonymous for people that sit around and can fix each other, you know. I needed somebody with a degree to fix me because I have all these problems, you know. I'm sensitive, and, you know, if I if people could only understand, I wouldn't have to drink and use the way I drink and use and. I went to that psychiatrist, and he told me, you, you know, he listened to me for about three sessions, and he said, you know, you really ought to go to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm like, I'm paying this guy money, too, I'm paying him like 75 bucks an hour or something crazy, <laughs> and I'm like, what are you talking about? I mean, I'm coming here already. I mean, I'm already coming to see you, and that's alcoholism. It talks about our literature. Here, we, here I am. I'm paying a guy. For him to give me advice, and then I don't want to do it, that's nutty, man, you know? That is totally insane. I didn't realize at the time, I mean, I thought I was right. I mean, it just sounded kind of good, you know? But turned out, you know, I know today that he was right and I was way wrong. And uh, it got worse. I ended up going to my first treatment center. My first treatment center was Baylor Care Union over here. Very, very plush place. I recommend it for Ron. You ought to go there. I mean, it's <laughs> I got a run and drag up on the top, man, you know. Nice double beds, you know. And, uh, you know, that's when people still cared about me, you know, would try to help me out. And they put me in that treatment center and stuff. And that's when I, when I got out, I went to the Plano original group and stayed sober 30 days. And, you know, went back to the treatment center, showed them my 30 day chip and I, Really thought I was onto something, but you know, I, I'm the kind of alcoholic that always feels like he deserves something. I, I, I celebrated by getting drunk. That's not a good idea. Celebrate 30 days by getting drunk. And Mitch, if I didn't say congratulations, congratulations for your five years, you know, don't celebrate it by getting high. It doesn't work. <laughs> you know, and, uh, that guy, I, mean, I mean, you know, and it just got worse. It, you know, we always get worse, never better, you know, never better. And uh, within 16 months of that time, I had, you know, abandoned that family, drank up that family, you know, and uh, used up just about it and was living in Oak Cliff in the motels down there. And uh, I ended up, you know, taking my first, you know, going to jail a lot already. And then I ended up falling to the penitentiary for the first time. And that was in um, 89. I fell for the first time and went and did about nine months in Dallas County Jail, which was no picnic, wasn't no walk in the park, you know. And uh, did, I only did six months down on the farm. And that was a lot easier. Doing time down there was a lot easier, you know, I mean, 
at least I got to go outside and stuff, you know. It wasn't like being locked up in Dallas County Jail was nothing very pretty. But, uh, and you know, when I walked out of that penitentiary, when I was leaving, you know, while I was down there, you know, I, uh, you know, I started, I'm, I play music, you know, so these guys asked me to play for their gospel man, you know, and I'm like, yeah, I'll do that. I mean, sure, I don't have anything better to do, really, you know. I've got a lot of time on my hands. So, <laughs> so and playing music is always funner than, you know, chopping weeds, whatever I was doing. I was actually working at a tractor shop down there, but, <clears throat> you know, so, uh, you know, I started playing gospel band, and I was going to church every Sunday, you know, with those guys. And, you know, then I found Jesus, you know, like we do when we get, when we're in a desperate situation, we find Jesus. Well, I know today that Jesus was never lost, you know. <laughs> He already, he always knew where he was. <laughs> it was me that didn't always know where I was at. <laughs> you know, and uh you know, and I and 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 when I was getting ready to get paroled, I knew I was coming up on come getting out. And uh you know, I prayed hard that I just wanted to stay sober. I didn't want to live like I did before I went in, you know, and and uh I'm telling you the night I walked out of there I was determined to stay sober. If you'd hooked me up to the lie detector machine I would have been telling the truth. You'd ask me if I was going to get drunk or do drugs. I said no, and I would have passed. You know, and I walked out of there. I got on the bus. They gave me two hundred dollars, which was a big mistake. Because <laughs> two hundred dollars for an alcoholic of my type is just barely enough money to get, you know, what I need to get to feel the way I need to feel. The next day, I went to my parole officer, and she said, uh, "Mr. Botello, you look like you have bought booze, bought drugs, and bought a prostitute." I said, that is entirely not true. I did not buy the prostitute. <laughs> Everything else she nailed me on. And they were going to send me back, you know, but, you know, by the grace of God, they didn't. I kind of straightened up there for a minute. And I went, and, you know, alcoholics, sometimes, you know, before you use everybody up, you always find some out, you know, some idea. You know, I had an idea at that time, and... uh it was my idea too, so that's why it didn't work out. But uh, I went and lived on this farm. I met this guy on this that had a farm. It was he was a Christian guy. He had a farm, and he let ex-cons come and live at his house, you know. And I went out there and stayed. My parole officer saw me out there. She decided maybe I'd do all right, you know. And I mean, I'm out on a farm, man, actually hoeing peas and stuff like that, you know, <laughs> feeding cattle, you know. And I was making, like, no money. But, you know, I was pretty happy because I wasn't drinking or using it. I stayed broke, you know. I mean, this guy was a nice guy, too. He's a nice guy. And, but, I, you know, I ended up going to work in Decatur. This is what it was. By, it was in Boyd, and I went, went to work in Decatur. And then I ended up going to work for a big ministry out there, out there uh, in Newark. You guys probably know who it is. I'm not going to say his name right now. But, uh, you know, I started working there, and I thought this is the answer, you know. Man, I'm surrounded by good Christian, clean Christian people, and I just don't have to do those things I used to do. And I'd put down AA because I'd been there before. I'd testify in church. I'd say, yeah, you need, you need this and not that and stuff. You know what I mean? But, you know, one day those people, you know, one day I was working, and I, was, I painted the ministry I was working at, and this lady was humming this whistle on a hymn, man, and it just pissed me off, man. I'm just like, you know, she was so happy. I couldn't get it. I walked right out of there and drank, man. Just walked right out of there. And, you know, and it started a whole series of selfish, self-centered things that got me, actually, they asked me to leave there, too, just like my vice principal did in high school. They said, look, uh, we've asked you to change your ways, and you won't, so go. I mean, that hurt. <laughs> I mean, they kicked me out. You know, they were charismatics, too. That's, I mean, charismatics take anybody. <laughs> uh Man, I mean, you know, so <laughs> I moved back to, I moved, had to move into Fort Worth because they sent me away from Decatur, man. They didn't want me nowhere near their town, around their people. And uh, I was a bad influence, I guess. And so I went back to Fort Worth and I started drinking and doing the things that got me in trouble and sent to prison in the first place. So, you know, I stayed in Fort Worth a couple of years, really, but man, I was getting in a lot of heat and I knew I was going back to penitentiary. So I took another geographical cure back to Oklahoma where I come from the first time, you know. I'm moving a lot. But uh so I went back there and you know, same thing, my troubles 
followed me wherever I went, you know. I like to tell people that I became so <laughs> desperate to stay sober, I converted to Catholicism. <laughs> and uh, that's extra funny because I'm still a Catholic today. <laughs> <laughs> I like to tell people that I go there. I do go there every Sunday. I, I like to tell people that I just really need the guilt, you know. <laughs> I don't feel guilty enough in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know? I need to go to the Catholic Church so I, they can really tell me what a really piece of crap I am. And, <laughs> I would probably go there more often, but once a week is all, all I can afford, you know. <laughs> They're kind of pricey over there. <laughs> Anyway, uh, <laughs> you know, I went back. I, I went back, and you know, and I and I actually, I actually got introduced. To, I I got real desperate. You know, I started have. I was still seeing my son all this time, and I had a car wreck with him in the car, and you know, it was a real scary thing. He was only ten or eleven years old, and and I called him at Thanksgiving because he usually came and see me on holidays and he wouldn't even talk to me and that really broke me so I went to treatment in 94 for the first time second to third time I don't know second time <laughs> and I got out and uh and uh you know and I stayed sober for a little while at the Phoenix group in Norman you know and and, and I got some sobriety and I and I really was introduced to some real exciting alcoholics and I, was, and I fell in love with you guys I did you know it they were exciting people with a glimmer in their eyes, you know, and they had this gleam and hope and, you know, and I really fell in love with it and got kind of active in it. But, you know, I'm not a very smart alcoholic. <laughs> you know, I met the girl. I got the job. I started getting things back. And I said, thanks a lot, you know, for the information, for helping me out. And, I, you know, they tell you don't get in relationships, you know, for at least a year, you know, and. And, uh, and I did, and, and it was a mistake, you know, and it, and it wasn't her fault. It was just not a good idea because pretty soon, instead of do, working the program Alcoholics Anonymous, I was doing what she wanted to do, you know, and it's doing, like, let's go to the movie instead of a meeting. All right, you know, I mean, I want to please her. I'm a people pleaser too. And so, you know, I, I went back out, and I tell you this, you know, after being introduced to it, I tried to get back, and I did get back for another six months, seven months, and then went back out again, and for, Five years until I got locked up in the penitentiary the last time. Uh, I stayed out there, you know, miserably drinking and using because I knew what it was like to be sober and around exciting people. And I tell you what, they talk about alcoholics and honest messes up your drinking. It really does. And I just drug along the bottom like that. And I, you know, and I, I drank myself to a place where I was living in a motel room and uh, just working to drink. In years, I, was, I had to live during the methadone clinic because I didn't have a car. Well, I had a car, but it really didn't run too great. And, uh, you know, I had to live real real close to the methadone clinic so I could walk there in case anything major happened because I needed that. And I had a nice little beer joint near, not a beer joint, but a place I could go buy some beer, you know, and pretty close by. And, uh, you know, I knew I was drinking myself to death and using myself to death, but I really just didn't care anymore. I just gave up. I gave up hope of any hope in my life. You know, I was all like, oh, come on, I'm wishing for the end. I want to drink myself to death. Feeling sorry for myself, too. I thought, everybody's going to be so sad, nobody was going to be sad. Maybe maybe my mom, nobody else. And she was pretty much had it with me, too, you know. And when your mom had it with you, man, that's a bad deal. But, you know, that... What happened was is um, I went to work one day I, on the way home, pulled over to a friend's house, and got a couple of things to pop in my mouth, and uh, stopped at the beer store. And uh, I, you know, I always thought I could time it. You know, by the time those Xanax hit my hit me real good, I'd be pulling in the motel I lived, and I could just go in and crash. You know, <laughs> I thought I had this down to a science, but you know, I guess I drank too much beer and it kind of accelerated the other stuff. <laughs> anyway, I ended up kind of driving half on, half off Highway 35 and, you know, police put the net on me and they're like, they pulled me over. And I'm like, oh my God. I already had a warrant out for my arrest, you know, and uh, yeah, it was not a good thing, you know, so uh, they pulled me over and they... They said, hey, you've been drinking while well, I had a beer spilling all over. You know how we try to stash beers, you know? Just shooting out all over under my seat. 
<laughs> you know, I don't know what we think, man. But I was trying to hide it. I go, yeah, yeah, I have been. I go, well, uh, what are you doing driving? I'm like, boy, you know, I, I'm too drunk to walk. That's for sure. <laughs> You know, and they did me the best favor they could do me. You know, they took me to jail and, and, and my family did the best favor they could do me. They didn't get me out. You know, this time they were, everybody was done with me. You know, they just said, do your time. I was already out on bond. I was on probation and I just caught another DUI. You know, that's pretty much all those things come together and uh, they gave me a nickel. So I spent 11 months in Oklahoma County Jail and they sent me to John Lilly Correctional Facility in Bowley. And uh, that's where the good part of the story comes in because the sponsor I have today, Steve C. from Shawnee, you guys, most of you guys know him. Him and Brad and uh, Adam every Sunday night brought a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous to that, to that penitentiary, you know. And uh, boy, for that, you know, I owe that guy my life. For them for doing that, I can I owe him something I can never repay. You know, because uh, you know I, I went to that penitentiary and I, I, I knew I wanted to go to AA. I'd been 11 months, you know, locked up in jail. They didn't have AA at, at the time in the county jail. They do now. And uh, I went in and I looked on the activities board, <laughs> and it said uh, AA meeting every Sunday night. The great fat group. Well. I didn't know that Steve had started another group, but I did know he had started the group fat group. And so when I saw that sign, his face come to mind, you know. But then I thought, you know, he's about 17, 18 years sober by now. I had known him from before when I got sober before. Surely he's not bringing this meeting here. But, you know, I walked in there and there he was, you know. I'm like, good Lord. So I go over and I talk to him for a while. And then after the meeting, I asked him to sponsor me, you know. And, you know, sponsoring somebody in the penitentiary is kind of easy, really, you know. <laughs> You don't ask to ask him to not date in the first year. <laughs> no shower dates, nothing, okay? <laughs> anyway, I know that's not too politically correct, but anyway. Uh, but, you know, uh, he did it, you know, and he gave me, any, any, and right off he started me with program of action. He told me to start praying on my knees, and I'm like, God, you know, pray on my knees. I gotta pr- I'm in a dormitory, you know. i got to pray in front of all these guys, but that's okay. You know, I did it, and I was, I was pretty beat down. I mean, he said, you willing to go to any length? Well, I had a shaved head, Gilligan's, you know. You know what Gilligan's are, huh, Chris? And, uh, you know... I mean, I, I'm in prison. I was ready for anything. I wanted what he had. He was going home, you know, to a pretty wife and three kids, two at the time, maybe three. And, uh, you know, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go to any lakes right now, you know, at this point. I'm whooped. And he started me on a program of action. <laughs> and, you know, we worked the steps. The first step was the funniest thing, you know, he goes, uh, when he did my first step, he said, uh, write down some things, some times that you were powerless, you know. And, you know, I've been in AA before. I said, what about the unmanageability part? He goes, you are in the penitentiary. <laughs> you are not managing your life, okay, Slick? You know, and I haven't, I haven't tried to elaborate or embellish any of the stuff. <laughs> you know, pretty much just doing what he said. Because that kind of hurt my feelings, you know. I mean, I'm sitting there. <laughs> He hadn't been that nice of a guy to me all the time, but he's a great guy. You know, I love him to death. He's a good guy. And, uh, you know, I got out after nine months, and we were shocked. You know, I told him, I'm coming up for all, and he goes, you can forget that. You know, I've had, I've got like 15 felonies on my record and stuff. And, you know, Frank Keating was a governor, and you probably don't know who he is, but he's not, the, he, uh, he, uh, you know, he's, he's a deal. And, uh, he didn't, he didn't have a history of parole and very many people, but he paroled me, you know, and I, and boom, you know, I got a, they had a little deal I had to go to Norman for, in the jail in Norman for a few weeks, about a week or something, and then they let me right out on the street. I was shocked. I mean, they called my name and said, Monk and John, kiss your punk, you're out the door, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. And so I'm, st- <laughs> I'm standing out on, outside the police station, still got inmate on my back and stuff. I'm like, whoa, you know? <laughs> I called my mom, she came and got me, and, you know, the first thing, and I had prayed when I was in penitentiary that I would do this very thing, and this is where the miracle of alcoholics and happened for me. I got to my mother's house, 
And I called my sponsor, you know, and I called him and said, you know, because I tell you, I was totally out of ideas. I was totally out. And I believe with all my heart that Alcoholics Anonymous works best when you're totally without any idea. If I'd had one more idea, I mean, how many ideas could I have? I had $60 worth of gang pay and no clothes, you know. And, you know, $60 is enough to do something. But, you know, I didn't want to live like that anymore. And I was just, I didn't know. I knew at that point in my life that I did not know how to live life on life's terms. So I called Steve. And I said, what do I do now? I'm out. I'm. What do I do? And he goes, well, go to a meeting tonight. Now, you know, he was saying I needed a meeting. What I thought I needed was $500 in a car, you know. <laughs> but, you know, I went to a meeting that night, you know, and it's been quite a ride ever since, you know. My first road trip was to here, you know, to Mike's 15-year birthday. It was my first road trip with my sponsor. And you know, what a great deal it's been. And then, you know, one of my, my second road trip was to come down to Mike's house again. I mean, Mike's been a part of my life, too. All these people, Ronnie, you know, all these people are in this group and stuff that, you know, I, I like to tell people, you know, I travel... 1,700 miles to go all the way to Montana get insulted by Mike. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's desperation, you know. <laughs> but I tell you, my life's been great, you know. Today I live in it. I'm not rich. I haven't, you know, he was talking about the sunshine and all that stuff. Well, you know, every day is not Christmas, you know. But I tell you what, today is a lot better than it used to be. I mean... There was a time in my life when I had fun drinking and doing drugs and stuff, but those times are way gone. You know, they've been gone for a long time. You know, <laughs> and uh, today my life is okay. You know, I work at a job, I work for a living, and I get paid money, and I pay my bills, and my lights are on. You know, I don't have to worry about coming on, come, and you know, my electricity be off. Or, you know, well, you know, I was living in motels towards the end of my. Drinking and, you know, you always dread those three words. Check out time. <laughs> 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 you know, you're like, oh, no. You know, <laughs> you know, I don't have to, I don't, I don't worry about those things anymore. I mean, I'm not re- wealthy or anything like that, but I have, you know, all my needs are met, you know. It talks about in the big book, I love the part in the big book that says it. If we're willing to do God's will, he'll meet our needs, and and he does meet my needs. And I'm, I try to, you know, do God's will today. Mike was talking about getting these guys out of the hotline. I work the hotline. I, I do the hotline every month, and I ain't going to tell you that I love doing it. I don't. I don't like getting called at 3.30 in the morning by somebody gets on amphetamines, and they just want to talk. <laughs> they want to share their feelings, you know? You know, and... uh but I do it, you know, because it's the right thing to do. That was the first thing I did when I turned a year sober was get on the hotline. I, I've taken it ever since, and I, I don't plan on quitting. And, I, you know, I carry twice a week. I carry meetings to uh, one to a, one to a, the referral center, which is a, like a seven-day detox, and one to a halfway house. And, uh, you know, I, I just love doing that, you know. I don't always like, you know, a lot of Sunday mornings, it's the referral center Sunday morning at 9 o'clock, and a lot of Sunday mornings, I go to Shawnee to be with my sponsor every Saturday night, and I usually don't get back home till about midnight, and then a lot of Sunday mornings, I wake up, and I go, screw them, let them die. (laughs) You know, I just get up again, drive down to Oklahoma City again, and talk to people that don't really want to listen to me anyway, you know, because... They haven't had much sleep either. You know how it is in your first seven days. You ain't trying to listen to a bunch of AA cheerleaders, you know, coming in there all happy. <laughs> but I do it, you know. It's the right thing to do, and I sponsor three guys, you know. And that's what my sponsor tells me. I'll, you know, one of the things my sponsor always says, you know, look to the guy ahead of you, which is my sponsor, and people like Mike and Tim and some of you guys, you know, and and follow them, you know. Follow my sponsor, follow other people ahead of me in the program, and just try to drag as many guys along with me as I can, you know. That keeps me in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, man, you know, and it's given me a, a, a life today, you know, and just doing those simple things. They seem simple. I mean, they seem so hard. When I was still drinking and using, I, I just couldn't see, I just couldn't ever see how somebody could get from there doing that, you know. 
to be in a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous that's, that's asked to come down to Dallas and speak. You know, it just, it seems like, it seems like an impossible thing. It's just the miracle of this program because there's nothing I, I, I didn't do anything to deserve it. It's just, except just show up and try to, you know, try to follow my uh, sponsor's lead. And Tim, thanks again for asking me to speak. Thanks a lot. Hi, I'm Danny. Alcoholic. Hi, Danny. And I've been sober since April 24th of 94. And I'm very grateful to be in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous tonight. And uh, Bobby, I'm looking forward to hearing your talk. And thank you for driving from Oklahoma to be our speaker. And you know, happy birthday to Mitch. And um, you know, welcome to all our visitors tonight. It's uh, you know, it's great to have a room um, full of people for the meeting. And uh, you know, welcome to Jim and welcome to Ron and all the guys from the treatment center. And, uh, you know, all the other people, you know, Mitch's friends and family and, uh, people from other groups are, you know, glad to have you here tonight. Um, <laughs> I think that, uh, what I'm thinking about the most this week is the, the, uh, idea of keeping our side of the street clean. And I recently was reading through the, uh, the part in the big book that talks about taking a, the inventory and it talks about, you know, disregarding the other person's involvement in a, in a situation entirely and just looking at what our part is in a conflict. And um, um, I guess just some background information. Uh, there was uh, you know, something that uh, my sponsor asked me to do about six months ago, and I partially did it, but I didn't do all of it. And um, I, uh, you know, it just kind of gnawed at me. And, you know, I remember at Dave's book study talking about, um, you know, being, uh, you know, clean with your sponsor and, uh, you know, being completely honest with them. And, and I, you know, I remember at that time thinking, you know, should I, t- should I talk about this or should I not talk about this with Mike? And, um, you know, and then, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of nagged me for the last, uh, um, six months. And I was, you know, I was, I was at church this Sunday and, uh, we had communion and, you know, before you go take communion, it talks about, you know, I guess clearing away the, um, things that are, standing between you and God, and, you know, I kind of, for some reason, that popped into my head again, and, uh, um, you know, I just kind of made a decision I was going to, you know, tell Mike and, you know, trust that God would take care of the situation, and, uh, you know, and then later that day, Mike did something that made me mad. (laughs) (laughs) I know. He's he's horrible like that sometimes. (laughs) And... uh, um, you know, I don't know about you, but, um, you know, when I have, you know, something that I, I've, you know, I guess been concealing or that I shouldn't have done, my brain can turn it around where I can, um, you know, make it the other person's fault and, um, you know, all sorts of things. And, you know, my, it's just amazing how my brain really got to working on me and I had all this going and, you know, the next day I decided that, you know, what the heck, I'm just going to take the right action. I'm going to clear this up. And, uh, and I did, and, um, you know, surprisingly enough, I wasn't mad at Mike anymore. And, uh, you know, it's just such a powerful thing. And, there, but there, be, you know, before I got sober, there were conflicts that I had that you know, I just didn't see how they could ever work out. Because, you know, it's like, yeah, I'd see where I was wrong, but they did this to me. And, um, you know, that could just go on forever. And, uh, you know, I'm so grateful for learning how to, you know, just, um, you know, take my own inventory. And, uh, you know, and I have steps to clean it up, um, whatever the situation is. And it's just... Uh, you know, powerful the way that God works through that, and uh, I'm glad to be here. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Danny. Um, about Tim from the North 40 Group in Fort Worth. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate it. Guess you get to chair every every night this month, huh? Yeah. My name's Tim. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Jim. My sobriety date's January 1 of 1986, and I'm real grateful for that. And Ron and Jim, uh, I know Jim. I don't know about Ron, but I know Jim. Welcome back to AA. Um, and Mitch, congratulations on your five years. I remember when I got my first chip with a, you know, when you get a V on it, it separates you. It makes you, it brings you up a little bit. It's a, it's a big deal. Congratulations on your birthday. Let me tell you, not drinking for five years and taking these steps and working this program is an accomplishment. And, you know, as I was sitting in the back this evening, and I don't call this my home group, I met Tim. I brought my sponsor over here to speak, and I saw something here that I really liked. 
and that is a lot of people enthusiastic about living their lives that have obviously taken the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, at least the ones that I've shared with. And it makes a difference because um, all too often I think AA gets lost in the doldrums and and all too often the message of recovery, the message of life, the adventure before and after uh, isn't told often enough. And when I came over here and I saw the incitement, the enthusiasm, the eagerness to live being portrayed by the members of this group, I just wanted to come back and be a part of it and, and share in that. Now, I'm not going to make this group my home group, but I, but I believe me, I hope to bring a little bit here to you guys, but I can assure you this. I bring a lot of what you do back to my group. And here's how I do it. My meetings have tripled since I brought my sponsor over here. And all it did, all you've shown me is that AA is a priority in your life. That's all you've done. And I can see it. And I've been around AA long enough to know the difference. I can see the difference just like that. And, you know, I was sitting in the back of the room there, and it says, uh, welcome, to the Sugar Hill, welcome to Sugar Hill. And I see this picture of the sun shining in. And I can tell you that being sober for over 18 years, I ain't been living on Sugar Hill, and the sun doesn't come shining in every day. But I'm going to tell you what, staying sober and taking these steps, I know what to do. I've never had a problem in Alcoholics and I've never had a problem in life that hasn't been answered for me in the first 164 pages of this big book. And having the nerve, Danny, to tell my sponsor everything even though I know I'm about ready to get a chewing. Uh, one time I went out of town. I used to travel a tremendous amount, and I came back. He says, well, you've been gone for three days. You didn't call me. Why not? And I said, I didn't want to talk to you. <laughs> and, you know, that's how our relationship is. If I don't want to listen to it, I'm not going to call him, and I'll tell him. And that's the luxury of being there. But most of the time I come clean with him, and, you know, I take what I've got coming anyway because I'm not a, I'm not a dummy. I know what's going on. A lot of times I don't like the truth, though. It's painful. It's painful when I ask my sponsor to hold that mirror up and take my inventory. But my sponsor loves me enough to take that inventory every time I ask, which is daily. I played golf with him this morning. We had a great time. And that's one of the luxuries of staying sober. And, you know, Sugar Hill is uh, more often than not, I can tell you. And the sun comes shining in. And as long as I stick close to the program and do what I'm supposed to do, Everything's going to work out. What I get confused about is I want to play your role sometimes. See, because if I play your role, I don't have to pay the consequences. I've got to concentrate on what I'm supposed to do. And boy, it tells me how to live one 24-hour day right in this book if I'm willing to, willing to follow the direction. I'm not always, though. Welcome to everybody here. I'm looking forward to hearing your, your story, too, Bobby. I'm anxious to hear uh, how you're staying sober. Look forward to it. Thanks. Right. How about Doug? Doug! Thanks, my name is Doug. Hi, Doug. I've been sober since December 27th of 99. And Bobby, welcome. And welcome to all our visitors. Um, yeah, I, I, was, I was driving home today, you know, and I got a phone call and, and I looked down at the caller ID and I got very excited. And about five minutes into this conversation, it kind of went, you know what? I really like you, but we're just going to be friends, and that's as far as it's going to go. Aww. That will that will suck the enthusiasm right out of your voice, man. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, God, man, I haven't gotten that kind of a call since high school, you know? And it just, Aww. boom, blows your ego out. And uh, and I pick up the phone, and I call my sponsor, and he says, oh, well, that's about it. <laughs> Click, you know? <laughs> And it, it puts it in perspective, you know. And, and people, alcoholics like me who like to drink and feel sorry for ourselves, like to lock our, I would I would just lock myself up. I mean, it was nothing anyway. And I would just love to have a pity party and about five cases of beer. And, you know, it's one of those deals where because of sponsorship and the program, um, I just like, okay, you know, whatever. Um, you know, I don't blast them because that's usually the point in a relationship where you let them have it and you tell them what's wrong with them. And da 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 da, and it didn't happen. It didn't happen, and I'm grateful for that because you know what? Uh, life's too short, and um, 
you know, we've got a great program that works. If you're alcoholic, it works in all your aspects of your life. And if you're new, you probably got problems with women and money. Hey, man, we all do. So uh, welcome. Stay and uh, hope to see you again. Thanks, Doug. Um, Ronnie. Roddy, alcoholic. Hi, Sobriety dates August 12th, 2002. Bobby, I'm looking forward to your talk, man. I've slept with Bobby before. All right. <laughs> and, and um, <laughs> Spons, happy birthday. That's uh, you know, it, it's exciting to celebrate birthdays. It, it, and you know, I guess uh. I've always had, I came into this with so many misconceptions, and one of them was that, you know, I remember I've only got to celebrate one birthday, and I still wanted to think it was about me, but I've been taught that it's about, about Alcoholics Anonymous, and, and that it does work. And, you know, I, this week, I heard Danny mention what's been on his mind. You know, there's been something on my mind this week, and I look around and Ron and, and Jim, the, it's, I'm glad you're here. And, you know, I see so many new people come in and out and in and out and in and out. And, you know, was just working with a guy last week and, oh my goodness, if you could have heard it, you know, if you could have heard it, it was, it was absolutely, he was going to do it. And, and, you know, and I look back to when I came in. And I look back at the time, you know, I went to my first AA meeting in 1992, and my sobriety date's 2002. And and I went in and out and in and out and in and out. And there, you know, the reality was that towards the end, I knew, deep down in my heart, I knew that I had a problem. But no matter how bad it got up to those points, every time I got into AA and started getting what I was going to have to do, I couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. And, and I drank and I drank and I drank. And you know, I'm looking, I was working with a guy last week that I mean had nothing going on in his life. Nothing. You know, holding on to a job and that's b- barely. He's barely got the job, living in a hotel, you know, um, driving a motorcycle, fixing his license is suspended. Um, you know, ain't got no, ain't, doesn't have anybody to turn to. And, and to sit there and pour out his heart to you and tell me he's whooped. And he's hopeless, and he's desperate, and he's going to do whatever it takes, and he's not around. And it just it just pounds home to me what I suffer from, and I've been there. And, you know, I don't know what he might have to go through. I know what I had to go through. And I was the type of alcoholic that, on my own, I could not beat it. It's the one thing in life that thoroughly, utterly just destroyed me. And once I put that drink into my body, I was off to the races. And, you know, thank God that, that I, that I went through what I went through and got to the place where I, I said those things, but then more importantly, I did, I, I took the action. And I was to the place where I said, I, I've, I've said it many times. I remember saying, you know, if AA doesn't work for me when I came in this last time, I said, I'm doomed. Cause it was the only thing I hadn't tried 110%. And, I just, it makes me grateful for AA, makes me grateful for the newcomers, because I have to see that to remind myself where I come from, because it's real easy. My mind still tells me today that I'm not alcoholic, and that I don't have to go to the meeting, and I don't have to stick my hand out to the newcomer, and I don't have to talk to my sponsor and get clean with my sponsor. You know, it tells me all those things, and, you know, but I stuck around long enough, and as long as I continue to stick around and work with my sponsor and work with other alcoholics and try to stay in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous, up to this point, it's worked. And I'm looking forward to the rest of the meeting. Bobby, looking forward to your talk. Thanks. Thanks, Ronnie. Um, how about Greg from Lake Islands? Greg! Greg. I'm Greg, I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Greg. I've been sober since May 23rd of 93. And, and uh, you know, my primary purpose being here this evening is uh, is to support this guy here. So uh, if you don't mind, and if your ego doesn't mind, that's what I'm going to talk about. But five years ago, Mitchell called me and said, man, you know, I need some help. 
And uh, I asked him if he was willing to do something different. He said, I'm willing to go to any lengths. And so I took him to a meeting that was foreign to him. And we sat there that night and we listened to a man talk that I'd never heard before, never met before. And, and about halfway through the evening, I reached over and I told Mitchell what I heard Mike say. And I said, that's your sponsor. And Mitchell looked at me like I was crazy. You know, he was in a strange place and there's a strange man standing in front of him. I said, if you're willing to go to any lengths, go ask that man to be your sponsor. And he did. And that was a pretty cool deal. And over the past five years, I've watched relationship with, with Mitchell and Mike and relationship with Mitchell and this group grow and lead him to places that are absolutely unbelievable. You know, I respect this group for offering what they've given to my Bubba here. And, uh, and uh, it's, I'm grateful to be here this evening also. Thanks. How about Steve? Hi, my name is Steve. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Steve. Sobriety day is August 24, 2001. Happy birthday, Mitch. And uh, welcome, Bobby. Looking forward to your talk. Um, and welcome to all our visitors. Wow, it's awesome to see so many faces. Um, it's been a good week, you know. I got to spend some time with Spons this weekend, and that was pretty awesome. You know, I can tell you when I first came in, in August of 2001, I did not want to be over at my sponsor's house anymore because I thought he kind of hated me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I still, I still to this day, you know, I, I still feel somewhat uncomfortable over there because I know he's my sponsor. You know, we're not like best friends, but at the same time, you know, I, I see a lot of love and compassion that that he that he shows all the other guys in the group and stuff. And so, and I did, we have a good time over there. They're, we're not a glum lot, you know. And and uh, you know, and yeah, I can remember, you know, I hear that in treatment centers even today, especially when we go to Baylor and stuff. And you know, the the, the patients in there will talk about, you know, well, what is there if if there's no drinking? You know, what are we gonna do? You know, and I remember thinking the same way you know just there is no life if there if you're not going to be able to drink you're not going to be able to have any fun that's kind of how i equated it you know and uh and, and like a couple people have talked about tonight i mean it is it's just it's it's a way of life that's just unbelievable i, I could not have imagined it when i when i came in in august 2001 what it was going to be like today it just you know it's just a matter of surrendering and saying my way doesn't work and just following directions from a sponsor thanks Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.